Did you find the Yes, I did. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I wanted to oh, right, get this one. words about uh, your first coursework, your laboratory assignment, and then I move on to solving uh, the remaining questions from uh, chapter three. If you have any questions, please raise your hand when I go through the next couple of slides, please. So the exam for this unit, like other 10 credit units, carries a 10% of the, uh, sorry, 80% of the final mark. Uh, your examination paper is not uh, set yet, but as soon as your examination paper is approved by the external examiner, I will upload uh, your own uh, formula sheets or uh, data sheets. The format of your paper is very similar to the paper at the moment is online, similar to last year's examination paper, 21-22. Obviously, closer to the time, I will give you more information about your paper. The coursework for this unit carries 20% of the final mark, and I have divided it to three elements. The first coursework carries 5% of the final mark. It will be issued on 28th of October at 9 a.m., and the submission deadline is at 6 p.m. 11th of November. So you almost have uh, two weeks to complete it. It includes two questions. The questions or alternative versions of the examples I solved for you during the lectures. There's nothing complicated about it. You don't need uh, two weeks to complete uh, the coursework. However, because it's concurrent with the other units you're doing at the moment, and obviously you're doing some coursework for them, so I've given you two weeks. So at 6 p.m. on 11th of November, the portal for submission will be closed. So no late submissions will be accepted. If you have any mitigating circumstances that you cannot contribute to the group activity, then you submit a form uh, to the mitigating circumstances panel or the welfare officer will deal with it. If your case is approved, then this 5% will be discounted uh, from the overall mark of your unit. As I said, this is provided uh, you have evidence, you have a proper reason for not doing this element of the course. You can uh, submit your solution as a handwritten version of your solution. You can submit it online. And I uploaded some information how you can convert your handwritten solution to PDF format. If 
you decide to type it absolutely fine, a bush, you need to include the whole solution. So if you just type uh, an equation and you write only the answer, you will hardly get any mark for it. So I'm quite happy for you to just upload your handwritten solution and make sure it is a need for me to read it. And as I said, I repeat, if you want to type your solutions, you have to do it the way you do handwritten solutions. Like exam, you need to do the complete solution, not just the, an equation and answer. So that is a course with number one. It will be available next week. And the course for number two will be issued in week eight, and that is uh, based on chapters th three, four, and five. The first coursework is based on chapters one and two, which we've already finished. And as soon as we finish chapter five, hopefully sometime in, at the end of week seven or beginning of week eight, then that is the second course that will be available slightly harder than the first one, but again, alternative versions of the questions solved during the lectures. For the second one, you will have about two or three weeks, more than two weeks, to complete it. So these are the two courseworks. Yes, please. You didn't put the deadline in, so is it okay if I ask about what the deadline is for coursework number two? Uh, the coursework number two, I believe, is 9th of December, 6th year, 9th of December. It says issues issued in week 8. That's right. So you have three weeks after that to complete it. So shall we just at the moment focus on course with number 1 and your laboratory assignment sure. and then closer to the time I'll give you a bit of uh, information about your second course work. So the, new, the other 10% uh, of your uh, coursework is based on your uh, laboratory assignment. Your uh, la lab will start uh, next week. Some of you do your uh, labs in next week and some of you do it in the following week. It doesn't make any difference you do it next week or the following week. As soon as all the experiments, all the groups do the experiments, they finish the experiments, then on the Friday after that, I will upload the assignment sheet for the laboratory activities. So as I said, it doesn't make any difference. You do it in next week or the following week. So you do your experiments in the next two weeks. And you spend something between 45 minutes and a, or an hour in the laboratory to collect the experimental raw data. So you have, we have two aluminium tubes in the lab, so for every session, the two groups can do their tests on these two laboratory, uh, on these two aluminium tubes. You collect some experimental raw data. They include tip measurement, uh, tip deflection measurements of the tube, and also some extreme measurements. So some digital gauges are attached to the tube at one end. So using those uh, digital gauges, uh, you measure the deflections. And then some strain gauges are attached to the tube. Then they're connected to the computer using the lab use software. You get those strain measurements for different loading conditions. So this is what we call experimental raw data. So I will give you, I think it's already online, you've got a results sheet, you write down your um, experimental raw data, and you submit it at the end of the session. You take a picture of it and you submit it at the end of the session. Then, using those data, you fill in another document, word document, which is online, uh, online at the moment. You transfer those experimental raw data to that document, you make a PDF file, and then you submit it by 6 at p.m. on the day of your experiment. So this is what we call experimental raw data. They don't mean anything until you start analyzing them. So students in the past used uh, to be in it to spend another two and a half hours during a lab session to do the analytical and experimental analysis. 
But because of COVID from last year, this has been changed. So the analysis part will be done by yourself in your own time. So you get your experimental raw data, you do some analysis on your experimental raw data, we call it experimental analysis, and then you do some analytical analysis based on the equations which you got or you've learned or you will have learned during the lectures. Because by the time you get the assignment sheet, there's a possibility you have not have covered all the equations. So I provide uh, for you the equations you require doing your analysis, to be fair on you. So you will have the equations, but the, some of the theories will be covered by eight, week eight or week nine. So you will have the equations, you, s you have the assignment sheets in two weeks time, you start doing the analysis, and you submit it, I believe, uh, by Thursday, 30th of uh, November. The assignment sheets are about six, uh, seven, eight pages of that you need to fill in. It includes uh, tables, graphs, uh, some analysis, and so on. So I say the experimental activity has been divided to two parts. The first part is the collection of experimental raw data, which you do it in the next couple of weeks. And then you do the analysis, experimental analysis, and analytical analysis, and you complete the assignment sheets. That is called a part two of your laboratory assignment. Now, we, as I said earlier, we only have uh, two tubes. So we could have only two groups at a time uh, to do the experiments. However, some students, uh, they, it, for them, it takes only 30 minutes to finish the experiments. Some students take an hour. It doesn't matter if you want to finish it in 30 minutes, an hour, you will be given enough time to complete the test, and even if you want to repeat the test. So don't worry about the timing issue. May I ask you please uh, to be in the laboratory five uh, minutes before you allocate the time. If you are there, all the four group members are there, you can start your experiment and it saves, saves your time. Now, there won't be anybody there to demonstrate the laboratory or a rig for you. There are 45 uh, groups and there are 45 uh, groups and it is not economical is in my from my point of view it's time consuming and costly for someone to repeat the same thing 45 times. I have created for you a demonstration video and also all the information required are in the laboratory notes. So may I ask you please two pieces please please read uh, the laboratory notes and uh, re watch uh, the demonstration with you. It's only 15 minutes. So when you arrive in the lab, you just can give a, you will be given a folder, a step, all the st steps required uh, for completion of the <coughs> experiments, then bring that folder from the start to the beginning, from the start to the end. So as I, re as I said, may I ask you please uh, to read the laboratory notes and watch the video. So when you come to the lab, you will be given a folder, all the instructions are in that folder, and you will be on your own. Four of you do the experiments, and you based on my experience, 95% of the students do it very well. So I'm sure you are intelligent people here, it's not difficult, somebody tells you how they test, are going to be done to do it. The tests are very, very straightforward. And the laboratory is located on the fourth uh, floor of the Chad, uh, James uh, Chadwick building. It's the white and a green building next to the engineering building. A. So, are there any questions you think? I 
That is a very, so if this is not the correct day, please refer to your uh, large, I think it's course timetable issued uh, by the department. I gave them the timetable, I believe uh, the thesis of November is correct. Oh, yeah. It could be, so it could be the yes, day. Yes, but. Oh, so the thesis of November is correct, so the day, thank you very much for that. Any other questions? That was a good point. Any other questions? Did I answer any any anything you think I didn't cover? And I wrote about three pages, I believe, uh, the possible questions you may have. Yes. What is the real deadline of the lab? Because my lab starts on Wednesday, the second of November. <laughs> is it all the way until the thirtieth, or? So I repeat, you all of you do your laboratory sessions next week and the week after. Yes. And all the laboratory sessions will finish by third of November. <coughs> on fourth of so. And you submit uh, your experimental raw data on the day of your experiment. The laboratory assignment sheets must be submitted by Wednesday, 30th of November. So all of you have almost uh, three weeks to complete your assignment sheets for the laboratory activity. Does it answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And each assignment you do, you've got a submission portal. At the moment, you have a sort of, if you go to the group that has been created for you on Blackboard, you've got at the bottom, you've got a submission portal for your experimental raw data. So if you've done your experiments today and the submission deadline is 6 p.m. today, the portal will close at that time and you cannot submit your work anymore. So other coursework the same. As soon as the coursework is set, then close it to the submission deadline. You will have a portal for submission. Similar to what you see at the moment here. Any question in regard to this? It doesn't make any difference who submits the work. I cannot see who submitted it. I only see that the group has submitted the work. <laughs> yes, yes. So is, the, is the experiment, is there a practical work? Is it in groups? Or? Everything is a group. So we do a group submission? Yes. We do a group submission. Everything is group. Yes. Even coursework? Any, everything you do. Yes. As I said, you only have the submission portal is for a group. I don't see who submitted it. I see group say group 40 has submitted it, group 50 has submitted it, group 30 has submitted the work. Any other questions? Okay. Now, I started and finished a chapter two last week. I started chapter three on Monday. I believe one of the slides, I was half through uh, slide 15, that um, I noticed that it was five minutes to the time, so that itself has not been recorded. So what I do, I briefly go through the materials and cover it very briefly, the most important part of it, and solve some of the questions which are remaining from chapter three. So for a rectangular section, with the width of B and the height of H. The centroid, we know that the centroid of this uh, section is, X and Y are called a central axis. They pass the center of gravity of the section or centroid of the section. And I showed you that the second moment of area, which we use a capital R to show it, with respect to the x-axis for this section is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed 
and with respect to the y-axis is equal to 1 over 12 b cubed h. If I want uh, to find uh, the second moment of area of this section with respect to other axes which are parallel to the central axis, then I need to use a parallel axis uh, theory. The second moment of area, for example, for this section with respect to capital X axis is equal to the second moment of area with respect to the central axis X plus the area of the rectangle plus multiplied up by the square of the perpendicular distance between the two axes. The second moment of area with respect to the capital Y axis is equal to the second moment of area of the section with respect to little y plus the area multiplied by the square of the perpendicular distance of the two axes. If you're analyzing a thin wall section, and that is a slide number 12, we just use the same equations as we do for solid sections or thin wall sections. The only difference is because the section is very thin, we can make some approximation. And there is a huge section in the aircraft structures, <coughs> the book by Maxim, aircraft structures book by Maxim, for analysis of the thin wall sections. So when the section is a thin, in calculation of the second moment of area, we ignore the higher power of t, t squared, t cubed, and so on. We do not show it like a thick wall section. We show it with the mid shell or mid line of the walls of the section. So we just show it by a line similar to the one I've drawn it for you here. And again, when we are calculating the second moment of area, we ignore the overlap of the material. It looks as if we've got a panel, a sheet, which is folded at different locations. So we ignore we have overlap of the material at the corners. Now before we move on to a slide 15, which is slightly harder, I <coughs> would like us to solve a question in number 1D. Now, at the end of this section, I've given you the cross-sections of different beams, thick, thin. And I also prepared, given you a table showing you the position of the centroid of each section and the second moment of area of each section. So you've got the answers. You've got the position of G as well. So obviously, you can just work on all of them. And I've given Given you the, I will give you the solution, or I've already given you some of the solutions, as much as I can. And as I said, in the recommended textbooks and the books available online, the e-books, you can find loads of very good examples for thin walled sections. So this is an eye section. It's a thin walled section. Obviously, it has two axes of symmetry. So we don't need to find the position of the centroid. But the, we have two axes of symmetry. Where they meet, that is center of gravity. The section has a uniform thickness. So T is uniform around the section. It's an I section similar to the one at the moment. Above us, more, we are standing behind on the floor. We are standing on them. So this is an I section beam. Our objective is to find a second moment of area. So assuming this is a composite section, which it is, we can divide it to a smaller sections. When we say composite, it doesn't mean it's a composite material. The section can be divided to a smaller regular shapes. So here we can divide this to two horizontal panels and a vertical wall. So I can say the second moment of area of the section with respect to the x-axis is equal to the summation of the second moment of area of these two panels 
and the vertical panel or vertical wall. For analysis, the best thing is we identify the local axis of each of these smaller sections. So here, the green dots are the central gravities of each of those smaller shapes or smaller sections, the top panel, the bottom panel, and the vertical panel. So I start with the top panel. I x of the top panel with respect to its own uh, local axis. Actually, it started with the vertical one. So for the vertical one, for the vertical one, the local axis and the global axis are the same. If we say this is the global axis for these three smaller geometries, then I can say for the vertical wall, the local axis and the global axis are collinear or coincident. So I don't need any parallax theory. So for the vertical wall, the width is equal to t, the height is equal to 2a, so therefore I can say 1 over 12 bh cubed, that is the vertical wall. I don't need any parallax theory. Now I move on to the top panel and the bottom panel. The width of the top panel is 2a. So for the top panel, with respect to its own local axis, is equal to 1 over 12 b, which is 2a. Yes, please. Wait, so, th so, if the so if the two coordinate systems, local and global, are coincident, they're also called cornelian? No, collinear means if oh, two collinear. Collinear means the two lines are in this located in the same direction, we call them collinear. Oh yeah, just misheard it. So for the top panel, the width is 2a, the height is t. So we have 1 over 12 bh cubed. B is equal to 2a, height is equal to t. But because the top panel is offset from the <coughs> x-axis, therefore we need parallax theory. So I say, with respect to its own axis is equal to 1 over 12, 2a t cubed, plus 2a <coughs> t, which is the area of this top panel, multiplied by this a square of this perpendicular distance, which is a squared. Now the top panel and bottom panels, both of them are located with the same distance from G, or axis X. Therefore, if I find for one of them, the value of Ix, I just multiply it by T. Now, as I said earlier, for thin sections, we ignore the high power of T, because it's very, very small. It does not affect the solution. So therefore, I can say, in this case, this term can be ignored. So the answer is equal to 4.67 a cubed t. So that is for ix. Now we move on to iy. Now if you look at the y-axis for the top panel, y-axis for the bottom panel, and y-axis for the vertical panel, they're all collinear. They're all in the same direction. Therefore, we don't need any parallel axis theory for the y, i, y value. So in that case, I can say i, y is equal to 1 over 12, t cubed, 2a for the middle part, and then I can just find the i, y for the top or bottom and multiply it by 2. So 1 over 12, t cubed, which is b, b is equal to t, height is 2a, plus twice for the top and bottom panels. And ignoring the high power of t, the answer will be equal to 1.34 a cubed t. So this I section is quite stiff and strong. 
against a bending moment about the x-axis. So all the eye sections at the moment, which are holding us in position, they're all located vertically. They're not located horizontally. So they're all eye sections at the moment. Underneath these slabs, they're all vertical. So any question regard to this slide? Yes, question you can pass it up. So we move on to question number 14 please. I think, uh, sorry, it's line number 14 which is actually solution for question 1i. So whatever you see on slide 14 is examinable. You should know how to find the centri centroid or center of gravity of a semicircular thin wood section. So I know I went through it, but I just go through it again. So for this uh, slide number 14, this section has a one axis of symmetry. So therefore, the center of gravity is located on the x-axis. So y bar is equal to 0. This equation is valid for any shape, solid or thick or thin wood. So I can use this equation. But for thin sections, we can make some approximations. For example, we can say, because it's very thin, like a strip, say with this semicircular section with a uniform thickness of T, is like a strip with the height of T and the length of pi r, which is the perimeter of half a circle. So pi r t is the area of the section. Now look at the top one. The top one is a double integral. dA is equal to dx dy. And x is a Cartesian coordinate, which we use it for a rectangular section. Now here, I can use a curvilinear coordinate system. A curvilinear coordinate system is one dimensional, but is in a curvilinear manner. So, say the origin of this curvilinear coordinate system is this open end. Now, the coordinate of any point is just the distance from the origin on this curved path. So, say on this section, we pick an element such as ds with the length of ds. So d in this case, which is a double integral dx dy, for this thin section can be converted to a single integral. So I say dA now is equal to t times the length of the element, which is ds, in a curvilinear coordinate system. Now I have got now a curvilinear coordinate system, S, a Cartesian coordinate, x. So the best way of analyzing it to convert both of them to polar coordinates. 
So if I assume uh, the origin of the polar coordinates, it means a theta equal to zero is about y-axis, then I can say x is equal to r sine of theta and d s is equal to r d theta if I just substitute in the top equation and integrate a theta between zero and pi then I can find the position of x bar which is 2 r over pi which I've been through it with you on Monday are there any questions in relation to slide 40? So we move on to the next slide, a slide a 15 which I couldn't finish. I believe it was not recorded. So we are going to calculate Ix and Iy for this section. And that is solution for example 1i. Now for semicircular sections or arc sections in majority of textbooks, the design handbooks, they give you Ix and Iy not respect to its central axis, with respect to axis passing through the center of a circle, because it's more convenient to be used, to be applied. So here we're going to find Ix and Iy for this semicircular region. So again, this equation is valid. Ix is equal to y squared dA. Again, dA can be converted to TDS, or TRD theta, and y is equal to r sine of theta. Sorry, y is equal to r cosine of theta. So if I substitute the values, I have com then I can convert a double integral in Cartesian coordinate system to a single integral in the polar coordinate system. Now theta is changing between pi between 0 and pi, so this is the starting point and this is the end point. Now cosine squared of theta is equal to 1 plus cosine of 2 theta over 2. The integral of 1 is equal to theta. The integral of cosine of 2 theta is equal to 1 over 2 sine of 2 theta. So once you do the integration and substitute the values of pi and zero, so this is equal to Ix for a semicircular region with respect to the x-axis passing through its center. If you just repeat it for Iy, you can see for both of them is equal to pi r cubed t over two. So for a semicircular region, Ix is equal to Iy is equal to pi r cubed t over 2. Any question in regard to this slide? Both equations and both answers, these two are available in your examination data sheets. However, it's examinable, hard to get from here to here. So again, these two equations are available as well. So you just need to write these and these two equations. Now we move on to a thin walled tube. Now the equations I showed you on Monday for a thick walled cylinder, they are still applicable for this a thin walled cylinder. If you remember for a thick wall cylinder I showed you is equal to pi over 32 multiplied by the fourth power of outer diameter minus fourth power of inner diameter. That is direct solution. But based on the equations I showed you earlier, we can, using a thin wall theory, we can find the second moment of area of this section. I can say the solution to this thin walled tube is equal to the solution of this semicircular region on the left hand side plus the solution for the semicircular region on the right hand side. 
And the solution for this two, I showed you earlier on the previous slide. So for this, each one of them is pi r cubed t over 2. So if I add them up together, therefore I can say ix for a, semi, for a thin walled tube is equal to pi r cubed t. And if I want to calculate j, polar second moment of area, j is defined as ix plus iy. So I can say j is equal to 2 pi r cubed t. Now what you see on the left hand side of slide number 16 is we call it an approximate solution for a thin gold tube. And what you see on the right hand side of the slide number 16 are the ones I showed you on Monday for a solid or a thick wall cylinder. So on the right hand side you see the exact solution on the left hand side you see the approximate solution. Now if I were you in your own time you can set up the both equations in Excel and change the thickness for a defined outer diameter. You keep changing the inner diameter and you can compare the solutions for these two. As soon as the thickness becomes small, you can see the two solutions give you the exactly the same answer. But for a solid section, I mean thick wall section obviously, the right hand one just gives you the right solution, not the left hand one. For a thin section, if the thickness is in comparison with the diameter is very, very small, then the two solutions are almost identical. Any questions in regard to this slide? Yes, please. I solve this example um, another time. I need to go now. Say we've got an arc. So for an arc with a central ang angle of phi, assuming phi is written in radians, please write it down for a slide a num for this slide, which is solution to question 1L. We've got an arc. Obviously, O is the center of the arc. And its central angle is phi in radians. For this example, we would like to find the position of its centroid and also its second moment of area with respect to x and y axis passing through the center. We do exactly what we did with the semicircular region. The only difference is we change the limits of the integral. So whatever I'm showing you here is exactly the same as what I showed you on the slides of 14 and 15. There's no difference. The only difference is the limits of the integral. So if you look at this slide, I've done exactly the same. I've chosen the origin of the Kevin coordinate system. And 
I've chosen an element. So I converted the double integral to a single integral. But look at the limits of the integral, please. It changes between 0 and 5. In the previous one, change between 0 and pi. Here is pi, which is a central angle. Now, if I do the integration, that's the solution. You've got it in your examination data sheets, this equation. And if I repeat it for y, y bar, I get this solution. Again, very similar to slide number 14. Only the limits are different. The limits are not 0 and pi, pi anymore, are 0 and 5. And similarly, if I do it for you, for Ix and Iy, the procedure is exactly the same. Look at the limits of the integrals. The only difference is we've changed the limits of the integral. So you have these two equations in your examination data sheets, and you can use them for any value of phi when phi changes between 0 and pi. So if you've got the fusel section, which is the last question of this um, chapter, then you have to use it twice. You have to divide the fusel to two bits, and then you find it's a second moment severia. So could you please write down next to these equations they are applicable provided phi changes between a 0 and 180 degrees. So if the angle is more than that, you have to divide the section to two parts to find uh, the second moment of area of the section. Yes, please. Can you go back one slide? Yes, of course. Not this one. This one? Yeah. Okay. And did you take a picture of this one as well? Okay. Okay. Yes. So say they want to solve this problem. This is the hardest one. So if we continue four minutes, I'll show you the solution. So you can um, do it yourself as well. So we've got a fuselage section. The thickness is not uniform. The carbon hold has been removed. So it's a single cell removed section. So the top part is a circular is an arc and the bottom the floor panel is horizontal with a thickness of two teeth. Yes please. Please gauge my idea on how to solve this. You split it into you split it into one rectangular section and two and two arc sections of two arc sections each one hundred and twenty degrees wide. Absolutely and then yes that's correct. So here we divide it as one of you said, we divide it to three parts. Now, I haven't calculated G for you here. I give it, I um, need you to do it. But if you find the position of G for this fuselage section is located very, very close to point O. And that is the solution. That is, so if you just follow the same uh, procedure I used for you for the other, sections on Monday. We can find the center of gravity of this fuselage section. You can see x bar obviously is equal to zero because it has one axis of symmetry. And you can see that y bar is almost zero. It means uh, the center of gravity is located exactly at point O. Now for finding ix and iy with respect to axis passing through x and y, here 
I've divided it into three parts, as one of you said. So this is less than 180 degrees. This is less than 180 degrees. And the floor panel with the thickness of 2 t is at the bottom here. So if you look at this, I have drawn for you X and Y for all three of them. So the solution of this is equal to the summation of the solution of these uh, three. So I've added them up. Say again, please. How did you get half a radius for the height? Do you have my five bar? Because this is um, 120 degrees, this is 60 degrees, so it means this must be half this radius here. Yeah. This is 30 degrees. Yes. The edge in front of the 30 degrees is half the. This so I'm not allowed to use these two equations because both of them have angles below 180 degrees. And what is the unit of phi here? Is it degrees or is it radians? Excellent, it's radians. So if I'm using this equation, a couple of students every year, they put, say, 120 degrees in this equation, which is not correct. So phi is in a radians not in degrees. So that is the solution. So look the way I've done it here. For the floor panel, the width is equal to this length in terms of R, 1 over 12 BH cubed, H is 2T, the thickness of the floor panel. We need prior access theory because this is offset from G. So this is the area of the floor panel, and this is the distance squared. Then we've got uh, two of these, each one of them with a central angle of 120 degrees. 120 degrees is equal to 2 pi over 3. So I just used the equation I showed you earlier for one of them, and then multiply it by 2. And for i, y, this is why is the axis of symmetry for the top section and the bottom section. So we don't need any parallel axis theory for it. So we can just use it at 1 over 12 b cubed by h plus twice. I do it for one of them and multiply it by 2. And high power of t is ignored, so this is almost equal to 0. So that is Ix and that is Iy. So this is a stronger and a stiffer against a moment applied about the y-axis in comparison with the x-axis. So it is six minutes to six. We will stop recording, so there's no point solving anything. However, I stay here until I answer all the questions you have. Thank you very much. and. See you on Monday. Have a very nice weekend. Yes.